Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 17. And before I actually get into reading the text, I want to start off by mentioning a current events issue that we should all keep in prayer that I know a lot of us know about, but not all of us, perhaps, that happened, let's see, what is this? This is December 14th. So this is just a few days ago. This is reported on. Man named Michael Cassidy, a Christian and former military officer, pushed over and decapitated a statue of Satan in the Iowa State Capitol. So in the Iowa State Capitol, there's this this statue, like shrine is set up with the, it's like, you know, imagine the goat demons that you hear about the Druids worshiping. That's what it looks like. And they had it set up, had the candles all around it, etc., and this Christian named Michael Cassidy tore it down, beheaded it, put the head in a garbage can, and turned himself into the police. And you can imagine the mixed reactions, all the way from the, I mean, the Satanic Temple of Iowa is pressing charges against him. And if you would like to look up Michael Cassidy online, you can find his Twitter, you can donate to his legal fund, because he is now going to be in all sorts of legal hot water for what he did. Then you have the debate raging among conservatives of, well, you know, that's really not the right way to do things. You, you know, there's a legal process to go through to, to, to fight against that. You really, you don't have the right to destroy property. And that whole debate needs to be fleshed out a lot more. I want to hash it out more as to what the biblical principles are, because on one hand, amen, with Christians, we don't go around destroying property. And on the other hand, Christians have a long and honored history of tearing down <laughs> idols. So, um, so I would like to pursue that discussion. I'm not going to try to nail down the details in right now. That's not really what I'm talking about. I want to zero in on what we do know and where we start as Christians I will say that until convinced otherwise, I think this man is a hero. And I say, huzzah, Christ is king. That head belongs in the garbage can. And you know what? At the end of the day, you count the cost and you're faithful to Christ and maybe you wind up in jail. Well, what are we here for? Right. Um, I think I think he set a great example of how to do it. You tear it down, you turn yourself into police. He's not out there trying to be lawless. He's not starting a riot in the streets. That's that's what the left does. He says, not in my state capital, and then go ahead and arrest me if you're going to arrest me. Well, amen. We embrace the consequences. We take responsibility for our decisions. But at the end of the day, we proclaim Jesus is king. And that's why I want to go to Acts chapter 17. And I want to zero in on what we can, where the, where the, the what do you call it, the nucleus of the issue is for Christians in these kinds of situations. Because we're certainly not calling for Christians to start some sort of anarchical, just go around and start tearing down all the symbols and statues that we don't agree with. Again, that's what the left does. That's the handiwork of the devil. Chaos, lawlessness, rioting. That's not what we're talking about. So what are we talking about? Acts chapter 17. This is recounting the journeys of Paul. Starting in verse 1, Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. So, a couple of things that I want to pull out from this text. First of all, notice that the Jews are the ones that 
that get offended initially. And they're offended by what? They're offended by the gospel. They're offended by the proclamation that this Jesus that I'm talking about, this, this um, Galilean rabbi, carpenter, you know, he, he was the Christ. He died. He rose. The prophecies have been fulfilled. He is the Christ. And the gospel of Christ provokes them to jealousy. Scripture talks about how this is going to happen until the Lord brings in the fullness of the Gentiles. And then there's, we look forward to a revival within the people of Israel as well. But so this is not surprising. This is the consistent reaction that happens when the gospel is proclaimed to the Jews, specifically in the New Covenant, the, the inauguration of the New Covenant, the era of the Acts, the events of Acts and the New Testament epistles. So we're not surprised to see this. And what, is, what does it seem to be? It seems to be, it says right here, it tells us, the Jews becoming jealous. Jealous of what? Well, it doesn't specifically say. I think the implication is pretty obvious. They're jealous of their political, their, their religious power. The, you're, you're coming in and taking away from our establishment, the way we do things, the control that we have over our people, the traditions, etc. So the gospel of Christ provokes jealousy in those whose power is rooted in religious control. If your power is rooted in religious control, if your power is rooted in uh, controlling people by their guilt, by their, um, their guilty consciences, there's a great Ayn Rand quote from Atlas Shrugged. talks about how you can't rule free men or innocent. I, I'm not going to get the quote exactly right. You can look it up. Outstanding quote. You can't rule innocent men, so you have to first make them all lawbreakers. You have to make a nation of lawbreakers, and then you can cash in on guilt after you've made them all Guilty and outstanding, and you could, outstanding quote, and you see it happening today. Ayn Rand is not an outstanding example of of morality or Christianity or anything, but she got some things right. She could see it, and she said it well. Well, if your power is rooted in religious control, think Catholic Church. You got to come to us for your indulgences and for your confessions and for your sacraments, or else you're outside of the state of grace then you're going to hate Martin Luther when he comes in and says, Jesus paid for that. And if your, if your control is rooted in your Judaic traditions and in keeping everybody under the law, then when Paul comes and says, Jesus Christ has come, the Messiah has come, you're going to be offended. That's messing with your structure, your power, your control. But it's interesting because they bring Jason and some brethren before the city authorities and what is the accusation that they make? They all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Now, I have not done the historical research, so you will have to forgive my, this is my interpretation just from the text. I don't think these Jews really have a problem with them being against Caesar. I think the Jews are saying what they know is going to get the city authorities upset. The Jews are concerned that this is messing with our religious power structure. However, if we tell the city authorities, this guy's messing with our religious power structure, they're going to say, so deal with it, you know, argue with them, whatever, it's your problem. But if we say these guys are messing with Caesar's authority, then they'll be, they'll be, on, they'll be on board and we'll get these guys kicked out. And that's, again, a pattern that we see throughout the New Testament. So then we have the gospel of Christ provokes jealousy in those whose power is rooted in religious control. And we have the authority of Christ provokes jealousy in those whose power is rooted in political control. So in either case, the gospel of Christ, the power of Christ, the authority of Christ, the reality of who Jesus is messes with your control. Because if I'm controlling people through their guilt, Jesus comes along and says, you can be free from guilt. Well, there goes my power. Because now they're free through this, this Messiah. And if my power is rooted in political control, tyranny, I, I, I make people do what I want because I'm, I'm the king, I'm the boss, and someone comes along and says, no, there's another king, and you better kiss the sun or you're going to perish in the way. I don't like that. That's messing with my, my rule and reign. Perhaps the best example of that that we see in Scripture is Herod, right? Herod's so freaked out by it that he murders a bunch of children. Because I, there ain't no other king going to rise up and depose me. Now let's zoom in on verse 6. These men who have upset the world have come here also. Now are these 
Jews that are accusing the Christians, are they using hyperbole? Quite possibly. They're clearly trying to make the Christians sound as bad as possible. But are they using hyperbole without warrant? Absolutely not. Are they, are they saying things that have no rooting in what the Christians are saying? Of course not. Otherwise, it wouldn't stick. You wouldn't say they're proclaiming another king if it could be answered by simply saying, no, we're not. What are you talking about? No, nobody said anything about Jesus being the king. We're just making this, you know, saying people can come get saved if they want to. That's not, the charge doesn't make sense if it's not rooted in what the apostles are actually saying. And so their assessment is that these people have upset the world. These people are troublemakers. The, the gospel that these people are preaching stirs the pot. It rocks the boat. It messes things up. It challenges the authority structures, the traditions, the status quo. It's a problem. We've got to get these guys out of here so we can maintain things the way that they were. One last verse I want to look at before we talk about this a little more is Acts 16. We're right there. Acts 16, 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. The Lord opened her heart. Very key phrase. So right now, in our day and age, the... The idea of winsomeness is in hot debate. Are we winsome? Are we empathetic? Do we, uh, do we present the gospel in a way that's going to win over the people who are, who are outside watching? Why was Lydia one to the gospel? Because the Lord opened her heart. Was it because Paul was winsome enough? No. It's because the Lord opened her heart. That is the key factor in whether anyone will listen to the gospel. That is the key factor in whether any dead hearts will come to life, is whether or not the Lord says, Lazarus, come forth. That's the only way it happens. Therefore, winsomeness is not our primary concern. Faithfulness is our primary concern. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean then that winsomeness is not a concern? That speaking edifying words is not a concern? That we just thoughtlessly start whatever fights we want to fight and hope something sticks? No. The question is faithfulness. But faithfulness cannot be judged by whether or not everybody likes it. In fact, that's a good clue that it is not faithfulness. Why? Back to chapter 17. Paul's being faithful. He's proclaiming the gospel. And what happens? Huge problems. The religious leaders are mad. The political leaders are mad. He's getting kicked out of the city. Not very winsome, Paul. You blew it. You're doing it wrong. Or maybe he's doing it like Jesus, who was crucified, because he spoke the truth. He testified to the truth. He was the truth. So, this is our starting point. Our starting point is that we are primarily Christians. We're not primarily Americans. We're not primarily politicians. We're not primarily friends. We're not primarily nice people. We're also not primarily brawlers or mean people or hot take posters who get major retweets because we said something so spicy and so based that everybody just has to retweet what we said. That's not the goal either. The goal is faithfulness. So when we look at somebody like this man who decapitated the statue of, de of, of the devil, my question where I'm coming down on for me is we have to walk humbly with our God. But we walk humbly with our God from a foundational assumption that I belong to Christ first. I'm a Christian first. That may or may not mean that I go tear down this, this statue. It may or may not. Maybe that's not the wise decision. Maybe it is the wise decision. But what I do know is if the Spirit of God comes upon my heart and fills me with holy zeal and God is telling me go tear that idol down, I do not want to be asking, is that going to be winsome? I want to be saying, yes, Lord. And then I'll turn myself into the police afterwards and come what may. Now, and we're, we're controlled by God's word. We're not talking about if I, I feel angry and so I'm going to go like commit violent acts or something. No, that's not what we're talking about. God's word is our guide. But as we're walking humbly with our God, our first question is, what does Jesus want me to do? Amen. Not what will people say? Not will it be popular <laughs> with either crowd? Not will it be popular with the left 
and the establishment, and also not will it be popular with the young, restless, and reformed people who want to see more, ba- more bail smashing? Popularity is not the question. Faithfulness to Christ is the question. I saw another video of a gas station where people, that, like five guys, pulled up in a pickup truck and stole an ATM. Like they loaded the ATM into the back of the pickup and drove away. And the, um, one of the, it looked like one of the employees is calling the police. Somebody else is filming. And the context of the video being posted was a bunch of young guys discussing, like there's a bunch of guys standing around. They should have done something. We can have that debate later. Right? I'm just bringing this up as an example of we need to be humble and walking with the Lord. There is a biblical principle of good men stand up to bad men. That is biblical. Amen. And in a godly society, it's hard for bad men to get away with stuff because they're going to run up against a bunch of good men who are going to say, not in my town. At the same time, there are also biblical principles about things like um, not grabbing a dog by its ears, where you could have a situation where they're not actually hurting anyone. And when the police show up with sirens and guns and everything, they're going to give up as opposed to if you go engage with these five men, you might wind up dead. You might end up shooting one of them over an ATM. So there's a lot of wisdom considerations and it's easy to just go from a a gut instinct of, oh yeah, if I were there, man, they wouldn't know what hit them. (laughs) Well, be prayerful. Don't be proud. And at the end of the day, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. We should start from a position of, I belong to Christ. I am willing to die. If, they're, if it's 30 people beating up on one person, they're just going to murder this person. I'm willing to just lay my life down to save that life. Or even just to simply to, to go down fighting. Because I don't want to live the rest of my life knowing that I just stood by. But at the same time, I'm not going to just be a hero because, no, you can't have my, the, the $30 in my wallet. I'm going to shoot you. Well, okay, what's my priority structure there, right? So we're walking humbly with our God. We're starting from a foundational presupposition of I'm a Christian first. So when it comes to our political involvement as well, we recognize that the gospel is divisive. It is winsome to the, to the called. It is winsome to Lydia because Lydia has a heart that's been opened by God. It's not winsome to Lydia because Paul said it just right. It's winsome to Lydia because God opened her heart. So we're praying for God to open hearts. And then we seek to be faithful. Not faithful in, uh, faithfulness is not defined by having the most based and hot takes possible. Faithfulness is also not defined by not offending anybody. Faithfulness is defined by walking humbly with our God, speaking the truth in love, not shying away from when God says, this is your time. It is for such a time as this. And now is the time to post the hot take or tear down the idol or get involved in stopping the robbery or whatever because Christ is king and we take our orders from him. But also not simply seeking to start fights if we're not humbly walking with the Lord in the first place. But we embrace the fact that we preach a gospel that turns the world upside down and that people aren't always going to like it. And so we seek to walk humbly with our God, to be soaked in biblical wisdom, recognizing that the gospel causes problems. But the gospel also solves all the problems that really matter. It causes problems in dead hearts. It causes problems in people that want to hold on to their authority, hold on to their sin, hold on to their way of doing things. But we come and proclaim the the rule and reign of Christ, the only answer. And this ties into everything that was already said this morning about conservatism. America needs to be turned upside down. And it's not going to be turned upside down by conservatism. It's not going to be turned upside down by family values. It's only turned upside down by the faithful proclamation of the gospel of the king. Those things go together. It's the gospel of the king. Repent of your sins, be forgiven, submit to Christ. That is the gospel that we present. And there's only hope in the name of Jesus. So may we be faithful, may we be humble, may we be wise, and may we be excited to be on this mission. Man, we're living in a time of opportunity. Such a time of opportunity. It... it, wasn't just any generation in America that you might actually literally have the opportunity to smash a statue of Baal. Yeah. I mean, talk about opportunity. Is there a cost to that? There's absolutely a cost to that. But that's what we signed up for. When we came to Jesus, to be his slave, to be his soldier, come what may. May that be our hearts. May we be humbly walking with our God and be found faithful in his service when the time comes. And really at all times, in whatever way he calls us to. Let's sin.